So last time we took a look at um, this file, this workbook with a couple of spreadsheets. We only look, took a look at the, the raw data sheet. And we saw how we could do some different things and use different views, freezing panes, et cetera. We could do flash fill, auto fill. We could create our formulas. We could set up our printing, remove um, duplicates, uh, sorting, filtering, all sorts of different things in just regular sort of Excel format. Okay? But we also said that, you know, oftentimes it's going to be beneficial for us to be able to do things a little more efficiently or a little more productively. And how we can do that in Excel is to change our data or change our information into what we call Excel tables. So the sheet we're going to work with today is the data in a table sheet. And like our first sheet, I do have some different little instructions here along the side that you can maybe try and do on your own. And I have a hyperlink to a little explanation of structured, unstructured, and qualified and unqualified references. And we're going to cover off what those are today. So I'm just going to go control home. And right now, again, we have the similar information that we had last time. So we're going to try and do some of the same options that we did before, you know, splitting the driver's name into two different columns, calculating an amount, and creating an email. But the first thing we're going to do in order to try to do this more efficiently or more easily is to convert this information into what we call an Excel table. So I can do that a couple of ways. I can go to my Insert tab, and I can click on the table icon and see how it says we can use the shortcut Control-T, and that works for both Macs and for PC laptops and we can create a table to organize and analyze our related data. So let's take a look at this and we'll just click on the icon. We come up with a window. It picks up with a selection of our data in the sheet and we can sort of cursor to say, yep, that's everything I have. And we can deselect or we can select that our information has headers and we can just go, okay. So I'm just gonna cancel that for a minute because as you know, it shows here, we can do a shortcut key. So we can also go control T and we get that same window. Now, one of the things that comes up is that when we have large data sets, we very often want some different statistics that we'd like to have summarized about them. And before we actually create our table, let's just take a look at something called the status bar in Excel. And just down here at the very, very bottom, right below the sheets and the this, you know, the um, moving, navigating across in the same line as the normal page layout and page break preview and the zooming, we have this here, it's called our status bar. And the status is just coming and saying it's ready. Well, notice what happens in the status bar when I highlight a range of numerical values. I actually get some different little statistics that come up. So there's 16 cells that were selected. The average of those cells is 864.37. Excuse me. The minimum is 225. The max is 11.99. And the sum is 13.829. So that's just sort of a handy little feature that if we wanted to know, say, um, some of these different statistics, instead of actually using the functions or the formulas to get these values, we can just highlight the related numerical cells and check the status bar. We can also right click our status bar and we get a window that allows us to customize what do we want to see in it. So maybe I don't want to see uh, the average. So I can take the average and the average has disappeared. Maybe I don't want to see the sum. So I can deselect sum and the sum has disappeared. Or maybe I do want the average and the sum, but maybe I don't want the min and the max, okay? So you can customize that to how you like. So just wanted to show you that as a precursor, you know, if we're dealing with just raw data, we could select any numerical data and come up with information. We could see how it could say maybe work on text data. Well, the only function that would work for this particular one would be the count. I have 16 cells selected. So it will work on numerical and on text data. But again, with the numerical data, it will give you whatever options that you have selected. And maybe let's go back, put the max and min. We can see them. 
maybe I highlight these cells. Well, the only thing that makes sense to do for, for these, this range of cells is to count the number of options. All right, so let's go back to creating our table. So remember, you can go insert and table. You can just click that icon or we can go control T, whichever you prefer, and we can create our table and I can go, okay. So notice when I've created a table, I now have this context specific ribbon that shows up under table tools for design. And now I have what's called an Excel table. And the Excel table has some different defaults that it's included for us. It's added a filter button. I could get rid of it by, by uh, deselecting it. It has banded rows and it has a header row. I could deselect that and then we'd get rid of it so we're not seeing it. There it's back. Okay, so I can remove it or I can keep it. Now we're obviously going to want to keep this, right? We can take the banding off. So the banding would just leave everything sort of white down here. When we have very large data sets, banding is another visual way to make it a little easier for our users of our spreadsheet to actually read the data. We could say maybe take that banding the row off and band the columns. You know, maybe we prefer that look to it. I'm going to put the rows banding back on and take the columns banding back off. I'll leave the filter on. And then we could take a look at different table styles. And again, we can hover over the different ones and determine, you know, which one do we prefer best? And there's a couple of different kind of styles. There's light, there's medium, there's dark. The dark ones are a little bit glaring in my opinion, but you know, you might like that. There's a gray one. I think I'm just gonna stick with sort of the basic light blue table style, light 16. And again, like most things in Excel, when you hover over the particular style, you get the name so you can confirm which one you want. So I'll just leave that. Something else with tables, it's usually very good best practice to name your table because especially if you have a very large data set and you have maybe multiple sheets in a particular workbook and they're, you know, a lot of them are going to have different tables in them, it's good practice to name your table so that you can then refer to it in a different way. To name a table, we just go in the table name box and I'm going to call mine delivery data and spell it right. You'll notice I've put a space in here. When I hit my enter key, I get an error because there's specific syntax that is only allowed in that table name box. It has to start with a letter or underscore, cannot include a space or an unallowed character, and it shouldn't be the same name as another workbook. Okay, so I'll go okay. See, it comes up. Now I have to reselect it, and I'll just go delivery, and I'll put data just as one word and I'll go enter and now it's accepting that name. Another best practice, especially for a workbook that has many tables in it, is to put maybe some type of little acronym at the beginning of the table name, something like TBL for table, so that if we have multiple tables in a, in a workbook, we can easily find them. What I mean by that is remember when we did the named ranges and named cells in our chapter two work, under our formulas tab, we had the name manager. And in the name manager, since I've named a table, that table now shows up in this list. So if I have multiple tables, it will group them all together if I put this little TBL in front of it. Okay. So that's just a little bit about creating a table looking at the different banding and the um, header row, the filter, the styles, and then naming it. <clears throat> if we say made a mistake or we decided, well, I don't really want a table anymore, what we can do is again, be in our table and notice here, now we don't have the table icon anymore. So if I go to insert, well, there's the table icon, but it's already a table, so it's grayed out. But if I go back to my table tools, design context ribbon, now I have convert to range. And let's come over here. Let's hover over convert to range. And maybe I say, you know what? I, I want the table to go back to just a range of cells. So it will keep all the data. It will preserve it, but it will switch it back to a range of cells. And if I do that, convert to range, it asks me for confirmation. I can go yes. 
And now notice I don't have that context specific uh, ribbon anymore. But I do want this to be a table. Uh, one of the downsides for me at least is that when it does convert a table back to a range, it keeps that formatting with the banded rows. So that's something that can sometimes be a little confusing. People might forget, well, is it a table or not? Well, the easiest way to determine that is to go to the insert tab. If this icon, the table icon is not grayed out, then it's not a table. If it is grayed out, then it is a table and I'll make a table again. And another way is that you can see that now you have this context specific ribbon table tools design. And I'm just gonna come back up here and I'm going to rename my table. I'm going to delete all this, I'll go TBL. And we'll call it delivery data again. <coughs> All right. So just going to select there now. now. So we've looked at a few different things. Now, the nice thing about tables is that we can add rows and columns or add actual table columns or table rows. One other thing we can do before we take a look at that, I'm just going to pull back the zooming a little bit here, is I'm in my table. So I can do different things with it, but say for whatever reason, I wanted to select that entire range of cells. Now I can go like this and pick it and maybe copy it and put it somewhere else, right? But I can also click on the header, then right on the line below it, click again. And now you can see that only the table column is selected, as opposed to if I clicked on the E, now the entire column is selected. So watch for that. If I want the entire column, there's column E. If I just want the table column, I should try and click on the header name and then the line right below the header name. And now I only have the table column, okay? It's a little hard to see. I know in the simulation training and exam, they sort of show it as a bit of a thicker line, but it's not showing as a thick line here. So it might, you know, that, that might be something you might trip over a little bit. Now, if I do want to insert a new column or a new row for my table, I can be in my table. I can right click and go insert and notice how it says table columns to the left or rows above. If I come up here to the home tab and on the insert, and again, notice I'm in my table somewhere and I go to the drop down for insert. We also have table row above or table column to the left. We could highlight say maybe the entire column, right click it, insert. But now remember that's just inserting a column. Okay, so it's not inserting a table column, it's a whole column. So again, let's undo that. Let's just click in here in E. Let's go back to our design just so we have that same ribbon. Let's right click our cell, insert, and now we have table column to the left. So now I have a, oops, I think I selected the different thing there. So let me come here, right click, insert table column to the left. And oh yes, there it is. And now I have a new column E. There's my column one now. I'm just going to undo that. So here I am in column E of my table. Right click, insert, table column to the left. So it's putting in a new column E. I can also do the same thing. Come here or maybe even here. Right click it. And I can go insert table row above. So I'm currently in cell C9, and if I go table row above, now I have a new row nine, okay? Just be careful because previously, you know, we would highlight the uh, row and go insert, but that will insert a sheet row versus a column row, okay? So just be careful with that. I'm just gonna undo those two things so I can come back to where I was before. We can also automatically add. So say, for example, I wanted to add a, a new line to my table here. I could go 100,000, let's make it 32. And I can go tab and notice how it created a whole new table row for me. 
I can do the same thing up here. I can come up to my M1 and I can maybe type in, uh, what will we do here? We'll just say, we'll, we'll just put count, okay? I can type in count. I go enter and it's created a whole new table column. Okay? So we can add rows, add columns, delete rows, delete, delete columns, but these are now table rows and table columns. So again, if I was here, I could go right click and I can go delete and see how now it's saying, okay, delete what? Delete that table column. So now that table column is gone. And I'm just gonna do both of those actions for the last three so that I keep that space for my column in. I can also do some different things in sheet three here. Oh, I didn't actually put it in. Um, I'm just gonna create a little bit of data here. Let's, oh no, I'll do that after, okay. So you could copy and paste. What I was gonna try and do was you could copy and paste from a different source and put it in there. So let's maybe try this. Let's go 100 and let's put 25, then one, oops, 26. And I think I have too many zeros in there as compared to over here. Yeah, I only need three. So let me just fix that. So we're gonna get rid of that. And we're gonna get rid of that. Oops, backspace, enter. And let's maybe make two more. So I'm gonna grab this set of data. So I'm gonna go control C or I could go control X. So I'm going to cut it. We'll use the home tab and go to cut. Data in a table, come down here and I can paste it. And again, notice, even though I didn't have any other information, it's copied that information into my table. My table has now expanded to 30 rows. And again, just because I have something selected in my table, similar to the raw data sheet, we do have the status bar here. So I have, no, it doesn't make sense. These are order numbers here. So the average and the minimum, and the maximum, the sum maybe don't make any logical um, usefulness for myself here, but I can see that I, we have a count. So a couple of advantages with tables. It helps to what we call structure your data a little bit better, and it does make things a little bit more efficient. All right, let's take a look then at doing some of the same types of things that we had done in our raw data sheet, but now we're gonna do it in a table. So remember we saw in our lesson last time in the raw data sheet that we had the driver's name with the two names, but we wanted to separate them out. And we used flash fill to do that. Well, watch what happens when I start typing John's name and then I do it correctly and enter. And then I start typing Peter's name and the same type of thing happens. And it creates it now for the entire table. Now I didn't have anything down here. That's why no names came here. So we have the same sort of type of functionality goes very quickly in tables. We'll do the same thing for the last name, May, and then white. And again, we get that flash filling happening. <coughs> so there's two options there. Now I'm going to just delete those two columns because we don't need them right now. So I'm just gonna highlight both the columns and delete them so they go away. And I'm gonna come over here to my email column. And we had seen last time in the raw data that we were trying to create an email from the first and last and add that happy.ca <clears throat> where we're gonna see something nice in, in the table application. If I start typing john.may at happy.ca and I press enter, nothing happens to start with, although it does make this a hyperlink, it recognizes it recognizes it as an actual email address. And if I go into the next cell, as soon as I type in Peter, we can see how, oh, now it's picking up the pattern. Oh, you want email addresses in here. And I can just go enter. And now I have all active email addresses. Other things you can do are you can move your columns if you want your table columns. So again, here's my table column deselected. And now I can come up to the top little arrow here. You just have to get the right icon and 
It's hard to find, get it sometimes. So let me improve my zooming here a little bit. There we go. Oops, keep losing. <laughs> and this is what happens with Excel with the icons. It's very hard to, to get the little ones you want. So let's maybe grab it there. And let's pull it over and see how it's moving to where I want it to be. Okay, so now it's over here in column G. So undo, it was over in D, redo, I put it over here and it got pushed over. So I'll undo it. So there was the item, there's the redo, and there's the item showing up in column G. You can also, you know, again, selecting your column, you can double click the width, just like you would in a regular sheet. So I'm just going to bring things back to where they were before so that we have the same <clears throat> information. So there we go. And we'll go back, control home, and we'll bring the zooming back to 100%. All right, so we did a little bit about with the um, creating the table, adding rows, adding columns, like in other words, table columns, table rows, moving them, deleting them, and copying and pasting to add to the bottom. Let's take a look at something else now. We saw in our raw data sheet previous lesson that we could remove duplicates. We have that same option in our table. So I'm in my table, go to my design, and we have the remove duplicates. Now I'm gonna create some duplicates first. So I'm going to copy those cells, control C, come down here at the bottom of my table, control V. Again, we can see how you know it's created now a duplicate set of order numbers 32, 25 to 28. And it's created the entire column. So we can see that our, our table now, or sorry, table rows. So now we have five more rows to my table. I'm gonna come up here to my first cell and I'm gonna go to my table tools design and I'm going to click on remove duplicates. Just like we did in our regular raw data sheet, we're gonna leave all the defaults. We'll go okay. And it says, yep, there was five duplicate values found and 29 unique values remained. So now when I go back and check, well, I only have the single occurrences of the 10, 100,032, 25, 26, 27, and 28. It's not in order, but you know that that's okay. I was just trying to show you the uh, removing the duplicates. Other things we can do in tables, let's take a look at the total row. So again, be somewhere in your table, the table tools design ribbon, click on the total row, and it gives us this total row that we can now click in that row and it'll give us a drop down of what are the different statistics that we can calculate here for that particular column. Now drivers names are just names, so let's just count them. And notice how it picks up that's 24 of them. It doesn't count the blank ones. Let's come over here to price and let's maybe calculate the average price. And it would be the average of the ones that are populated, okay? It wouldn't include the, the um, blank ones. And then we have the same thing over here with the 24 emails. And maybe let's put another one here. Let's maybe just sum. So let's sum this. So sum of all the number of items. So that's a handy thing to have too. When we have um, a table, we can add this table role and be able to see things. Now notice if I highlight all my items, okay, I'm just gonna cursor down so we can see the title, the total there. Notice how we have the sum here in the status bar is also sum of 551. So that's sort of a handy feature. Let's take a look now at filtering and sorting, just like we saw in the raw data. We're gonna do this in a table now. And I'm just going to make sure that we can actually see one thing. Notice how when I cursor down, I can see, at least as long as I'm inside the table, I can see that header row, okay? So I don't actually have to freeze panes in, when I'm in a table. It does make things a little easier to take a look at, okay? So I'm just gonna come down here just so I can see the bottom. And I'm gonna go 
we're going to say, okay, I only want to look at, instead of all the items, I'm going to filter out and just look at microwaves. <clears throat> now look at the total number of items here. So this was a sum, right? And that was for all the different items. When I filter on microwave and go OK, notice how that number of items now changes. Okay, So this is a nice feature of tables in that we can filter on one of our columns and we can get an updated total row. So remember, this was the sum. And again, I'm just clicking on the cell here so you can see here that it used the subtotal formula. Now we didn't use the subtotal formula. That's just another function in Excel. And I can come here and we can take a look at the window. So the function number is 109 for this. And the number of items is what was highlighted. We don't have to worry about any of that. We're just going to realize that the numbers do change. If I change that filtering again, and let's change it to, let's put microwaves and refrigerators, and let's pick just maybe George Ramsey. So again, it highlights there's three occurrences or three orders with George Ramsey, and the total number of items here for him with the different items that he has, um, <coughs> excuse me, delivered is now 55. So this is a handy feature with tables that we can filter and get automatic updates. We wouldn't have to you know, highlight the cells and check the status bar, okay? It's automatically done for us. So I'm gonna get rid of my filters. I'm gonna bring everything back again. So same as the filter window looked last time. Let's now take a look at sorting. So let's do the sorting within the filter box. So again, I'm gonna sort A to Z. Let's then sort by the destination and see if the microwaves stay all together. So let's come to the destination. Let's go to say, um, let's sort that one A to Z. And now we can see that just like it did in the regular data, when we have the two sorts that we do it through the filter box, the latest one overrides the previous one or the last one overrides the previous one. So I'm just gonna undo that sort. So we can see there was my original sorting and I'll undo it again. So just like before, you know, on our data tab, please try not to use the sorting option under the filter window and also don't use the A to Z sorting for more than one column. Okay, if you wanna do multiple columns, again, we're gonna to have to come to multiple sort. So let's try the multiple sort. Let's say we're gonna do by driver's name first. Let's do the <clears throat> items next, <clears throat> excuse me. And then let's add the um, number of items. And again, we have the same options that we saw before. And we can also do custom list or reorder. And maybe for the items, let's do a custom list. Now we already have a custom list from last time. So I'm just gonna pick that one as opposed to creating a new one and we'll go okay. And now we have the sorting, okay? So we now have it nicely sorted. So similar type things. Um, that we can do in the uh, data table, the Excel table, versus doing it in the raw data set. The big feature though is the nice feature of this is that if we actually filter, so now if I filter, I just say Carl, that total row shows up. Okay. Now we can filter by other things too. I'm gonna take, uh, take all the driver's names again. We could filter, say, with the number of items. So let's take a look at a number filter. Maybe we want the number filter where we have the number of items is greater than or equal to, and let's put 20. Okay. And when we go OK, now we have all the orders that the number of items was greater than or equal to the 20. So that's one of the things we could do. Another type of filter we could do is a date filter. So here I have to obviously look for a date function or a date field, I should say. So there's my date field and I'm gonna go date filters and we have some different options here and I'm just gonna go between. So I'm going to pick, um, 
what will I pick? I'll pick February and let's go to 1st, 2017. And we'll go between and we'll go February again and we'll go February um, 5th, 2017. Okay. And again, we'll see now just those dates between the ones I've set. And again, the total line completely updates. So that's actually, again, a really nice feature. So in a nutshell, that's our at least preliminary part of Excel tables. Let's now take a look at formulas in tables. So I'm going to get rid of all my filters. So I'm going to select everything. I'm going to get rid of my filter here, select everything. <clears throat> and then I'm just going to resort my data. I'm going to get rid of these two line items and I'm going to do it by order number again. Okay, so we get back to close to what I had before, except for these extra lines along the bottom. Now, when we had done formulas before, we had used the equal sign and we had pointed to cells and had cell references. And we had, you know, remember the mixed, relative, and absolute cell references. Well, in tables, because we have a structure in our table, that's one of the advantages. Excel takes advantage of this um, computer structure to make things more efficient, especially with that total row. So say if we go to the amount again, and remember we had calculated the amount by going equals, and we pointed to the cell E2, but notice how now I have a different cell reference here. It has square brackets around it. It has an at symbol on it, which means that I'm in the same row as where I want my calculation to happen. And then it has the, the name of that actual column, okay? And then I could just go multiply by and point to the number of items and the same type of structure, square brackets around it, the at symbol, same row, and the field name is number of items. But watch what happens when I press enter. It's not just that single cell that is populated or filled, it's all the cells. So this again makes it a little more efficient. Now, Excel tables have what we call structured and unstructured and qualified and unqualified references. So let's take a quick look at that by looking at this hyperlink. So I just want to open that. So I'm going to open it up. Ooh, it opened up on my other screen. So let's bring it here. So Excel structured references. So we saw in the spreadsheet that I was just working on that we get this squared and the at symbol around the field name of the table, okay? So it's a special feature of Excel that references tables, okay? And when we have the headers or the words versus the actual cell references themselves, it just makes it a little easier for us to understand what's going on. Okay, now we don't have to, let's say, look to the column. We have a proper name for it. Now, how we create a structured cell reference, very simply, we have to have a table. So like I did in the spreadsheet, you have to create your table. Once you have your table, you notice it gets that fancy formatting on it and the filtering drop downs. We then also get the design tab and we can name our table. And again, good practice, best practice, name your table and maybe put TBL in front of it if you have multiple tables in your workbook. We can then create a new column and we saw how we could create new columns. So in this particular example, for this little production data, they're showing the percentage of rejects, okay? And as soon as they press enter, that column is added to the table. So notice it's just the table column that's added and we had done something similar. Now here, since we want the percent rejects, we're just gonna point to or press is what they're saying. So select D3 and it comes up with the actual structured reference at rejects. Structured because it's using the structure of the table as opposed to saying the cell reference D3. The structure of the table says, well, that cell is in the rejects column or the rejects structure or the rejects field. And again, as I mentioned, the at symbol means the current row. 
And then to continue the formula, just like regular, you know, we have to start with the equals. We pointed to it, picked up the structured reference, and then we're dividing by it. Another way we can pick up the structure reference is to actually add or type in the open square brackets, and then we get a drop down list of the table fields. And we'll go back to our, our sheet and see the same thing. Then we can pick one of those fields. So for this particular case, they're gonna pick the output, and then there's the final formula and the final result. So this is a structured reference because we're using the structure of the table. We're using the names of the fields as opposed to the names of the cells. So notice in E5, we have the answer 1.9%, but the formula, instead of saying the D5 divided by the C5, it has rejects divided by the output for that same row that the formula is in. Now, something that also comes up, a term that comes up for us, is not just structured and unstructured. So structured uses the structure of the table. Unstructured means we don't have a table and we have just individual cell references. We also have what we call qualified and unqualified structured reference and a formula that includes a structured reference. So we're in a table can be what we call fully qualified or unqualified. If we're calculating within or inside the table, we can use an unqualified reference, just like we saw before. So I'm just going to come down here. So this is considered unqualified because we're still using the structure of the table, but it's unqualified. I'm inside the table. And basically, it just means that I don't have to name the table. But for example, if I wanted to create a function or a formula or reference the table outside it, so notice how here in C9, we have a function sum, and it's referencing the production table, and it wants the sum of the output field. So this is the table name, and this is the field name. Okay, so that is considered what we call a qualified reference. Qualified meaning it has the table name. And those are typically used when we are doing something outside our actual Excel table. Okay, so we here we have here our output is a qualified reference, the actual formula, because we have the table name within the function and we have the table field within the function. So I just wanted to walk through this one with you so you could see at least the difference there. So let's go back to our spreadsheet. So up here, now we can see that, okay, these are unqualified structured references because they're referring to the field names versus the cell names. Let's come down here and let's just put down here, let's do the same type of thing equals sum, we'll pick our function and we'll say, okay, I wanna get my table reference. So watch what happens when I start going T, B, L. Now my table name comes up. So I can say, well, I want the data from the delivery data table. And again, I'm going to add a square bracket. And now my dropdown of field names from my table come up. And I'm just going to put the sum of the, let's put the amount here. I'll double click that. I'll close my square bracket. I'll close my rounded brackets. So my function is complete. And I go enter. So that's a nice feature. This one out here, this is the sum of amounts. Okay. And this would be an a qualified reference because in the actual function, I'm using the table name. Now let's do one last thing. Let's actually delete all of these. So let's get rid of the content. So I'm gonna to go to my home tab and I'm gonna clear the contents. And remember we had done the first one by saying 
equals, and we pointed and then multiplied and pointed, right? I'm going to show you a slightly different way to do it. We can also press equals. And again, I can press the square open brackets. And now I get that list of the field names. And again, the at tells me that this row. And I could have, you know, maybe picked it from a different row, but I want it for this row. So I'm just going to go, what is it? We'll pick price. So double click, close the square bracket, see how it's selected the table field, multiply by square bracket, we'll go number of items, double click it, close the square bracket. Now you notice that the two columns, the two table columns are selected, press enter, and my whole table column in I is now populated. So if you need to review the structured and unstructured or qualified and unqualified, you can take a look at that um, website again and walk through it on your own. So a number of things we've done with tables then, we've created it, we've named it, we've added it to, uh, we've added columns or we've added table columns, added table rows, we deleted table columns, deleted table rows. We saw how we could move them. We saw how we can do the similar type flash fill, splitting some text. We did that for the driver's name. We saw how we could create an email beautifully in a table, makes it much easier than what we were trying before. And then we also saw the sorting and filtering. And that came in really handy, especially for the filtering with our total row. We saw how we could access different types of statistics in our total row. We saw how, again, we could take a highlight of what's in our table and in our status bar, see the results. And notice we have the, uh, I don't have them all select. Oh, there they are. They weren't all selected. So let's me select them all. And we can see here now the sum in the status bar is 551, which matches our total row. We saw how we could do some different things with our table in our design, as far as the styling and the banding goes, and also removing duplicates. And then, of course, don't forget to do your table naming. So that should get you started enough that you can go ahead and start working on your chapter four, continue on with your simulation training and exam, the section on tables.